morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today's episode is going to be a little bit different. And that's because due to a scheduling uh, glitch, Movie Math will return in its regular format next week. However, this was such a big weekend at the box office, I didn't want to not discuss it. So that will be the first story of today's episode. I'm going to do like a, uh, a basically a live reaction and breakdown to the box office. But anyway, before we do that, I owe you some winners on the Dolby Atmos giveaway for that uh, set of Luca Besson films, uh, The Professional and The Fifth Element. And you guys had Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of last week to enter your tweets. And as always, you did a wonderful job. So thank you again to everyone who entered. I had so much fun going over uh, your entries, uh, which again had to discuss why you think Luca Besson is a good director. Uh, and it was hard to pick the three winners, but I have them. And again, they're going to be getting uh, both of those Blu-rays, the set, uh, The Fifth Element and The Professional from our friends at Dolby Atmos. So if you hear your name listed here, uh, you should check your Twitter account for a direct message from me on how to get your Blu-rays. So third place goes to BTT viewer Leslie Bartiromo. And Leslie said, at Grace Randolph, hashtag Dolby Atmos, hashtag The Fifth Element. Fifth Elm was the first DVD I bought. Unique in the diverse music, would love updated soundtrack. So nice shout out to Dolby Atmos because of course the sound is remastered in their technology as well as 4K uh, visual uh, remastering. Uh, but Leslie, I love that you would be coming full circle on the film. It was the first DVD you ever bought, so clearly you love the movie. So I'm glad to be able to give you this upgrade. So congratulations, you again uh, are in third place. Now, second place goes to BTT viewer Jesse Gonzalez, who managed to incorporate uh, not both hashtags, uh, but both pictures into his one, uh, his, you know, his, his entry. So he said, uh, at Grace Randolph, Luke professionally caters to a variety of cinematic palettes with mainstream and artistic elements. Hashtag Dolby Atmos, hashtag The Fifth Element. I thought that was very clever. A lot of you did a nice job incorporating both movies into your entry, but I really uh, liked Jesse's in particular. So Jesse, congratulations. Uh, you are second place. Uh, that's just really, you know, bragging rights. You, you're all getting the same prize. But anyway, my favorite tweet came from BTT viewer Sandpaper Snail. Uh, and Sandpaper Snail said, at Grace Randolph, Darren made her an Oscar winner. George made her a star. Luke made her an icon. And then love you, Grace. Hashtag Dolby Atmos. Hashtag The Professional. And what I liked about that, uh, it wasn't the love you, Grace shout out, but I liked detailing the importance of each filmmaker to Natalie Portman's career. And I think that that is true because before she won for Black Swan, Darren Aronofsky's film. And before Portman was, of course, uh, Amidala in the prequels, she was uh, in The Professional. That's the movie, her breakout role, Luc Besson discovered her, but he did also make her an icon. And that, you know, George Lucas, you know, got, uh, she got on George Lucas's radar because of that movie. So Luc Besson, you know, really crucial there in, in, you know, making Natalie Portman the actress that she is today. And in fact, you might even want to consider going back to him considering the shape that her career is in. But anyway, I love that. I thought that was a great tweet. So everybody, thank you for your creativity. Again, thank you everyone who entered. And for the three of you, Sandpaper Snail, Jesse Gonzalez, and Leslie Bartiromo, please check your Twitter accounts for a direct message from me. All right, so let's get to the box office. And then we have some very interesting um, uh, announcements about some movies to discuss as well. But I'm going to look to this side today because that's where I have the box office numbers in front of me. Uh, and it was a great box office uh, weekend. I believe it was the best November, uh, first weekend of November they've ever had uh, in, in Hollywood. And that's very important because they've been having just like the worst weekends possible for the last two weeks. Although, as we've been saying, it's no one's fault but Hollywood because they've been putting crap into theaters, right? Like they're, like they're not trying on the one hand. And then also they're insisting on making these small movies that people are like, you know what? I'm just not willing to pay to see that in a theater, uh, which is a totally legitimate response and Hollywood needs to hear that all right so anyway I mean there's like this stupid thing that Hollywood's trying to you know you know make as an excuse saying oh well you know people uh, we, we split the adult audience there's just too many small adult movies and it's like no because none of them are doing that well 
people just don't want to go and see these movies on the big screen. They don't want it's not worth the money to them anymore. And they also have uh, you've made movies so expensive. I've been talking to actually some people lately, and every one of them has said it's too expensive to go to the movies. So people are becoming a little pickier in what they pick. So maybe they should work harder with that movie pass plan. But I know some people can use it, but it's really not something that's really viable here in the United States at large. But anyway, Spectre, of course, was number one. And the way this developed over the weekend was is that at first it came out of the gate very strong. And everyone was like, oh, wow, it's going to beat uh, Skyfall. This is amazing. Or come close to Skyfall. And Skyfall is the biggest opening they ever had for a Bond movie with $88 million. Uh, And, of course, it's the highest grossing Bond movie of all time with a billion, $1.1 billion. Uh, uh, so Spectre, though, deflated a little bit over the weekend, so it ultimately ended up coming in at $73 million. Not bad. I mean, that's the second highest opening ever for a Bond movie. Um, and they also had to come with the Peanuts movie. I don't think there's any crossover in that audience, but for some reason, uh, Sony decided to point to that as like one of the reasons that the movie didn't do as well. Uh, but Spectre, and, the, and just to underline that, Spectre's audience was mostly male, mostly over the age of 25. So uh, I think that to some degree, I'd be interested to know what the ethnic breakup of that was, but they didn't uh, release that information. Uh, but I do think that Bond, for the next entry, I do stand by the idea that it needs to be energized, whether it's the casting of Idris Elba or some other more modern element, because they're just not getting new Bond fans, basically. Uh, well, I'm sure there are some of you that are new Bond fans, but at large, it's not what it needs to be. So anyway, 73 million, uh, and it's still doing very well overseas. It's a 300 million two weeks of release worldwide, and that's very impressive. But Bond was so expensive to make that the industry is saying it needs to at least make 900 million to you know, be considered successful, right? I mean, that's the problem with these big budgets. We saw it happen with Mad Max, where they're like, well, you spent so much money on the movie, you have this astronomically high bar that you have to uh, get over for your movie to be considered successful. Even though you know, 300 is a nice number, it's only a third of where the movie needs to get to. So we'll see how it performs. Uh, but that's, so Spectre's, I think, off to a perfectly respectable start. But it's, it's, it's waning, not growing, and I think clearly that's sending the sign that something needs to change with the film going forward as a franchise. Uh, but then the Peanuts movie came in second place with $45 million, and that's fantastic. That's really good uh, for Blue Sky Studios because they have, the, you know, this is giving them another franchise along with Ice Age and the Rio movies. Uh, I have the animation uh, line up here. Uh, you know, it's another franchise for them, which is important for Blue Sky because they're having trouble competing with the crowded market, especially because of Illumination Entertainment. Illumination Entertainment came in there and kind of took Blue Sky's spot. For a while, it was like, oh, wow, it's uh, Pixar, uh, you know, Disney Pixar. Well, actually, Disney has only recently re energized, so it was like Pixar, DreamWorks, and Blue Sky for a while at the very beginning, thanks to Ice Age. But, you know, Illumination kind of came in there and is at the same level, and, you know, Disney Animation also got bigger. But anyway, the Peanuts movie, with opening at $45 million, that puts it, uh, I think, in a good middle ground. It's on par with Hotel Transylvania 2 um, <clears throat> and, you know, smaller movies like That Home, DreamWorks Home, uh, SpongeBob. Those all open with around $50 million. Now, they're still very far behind the way an Illumination movie opens and the way a Pixar movie opens. Minions, for instance, $115 million opening, Inside Out, $90 million. Now, of course, uh, Minions was a sequel, but uh, Inside Out was not. It was original property. But So Blue Sky just isn't quite the name that it needs to be, but <clears throat> it's certainly not an, a, a performance anyone should be disappointed in. And maybe the movie will have legs as well. They said it was a little heavy on the female side of appeal, so maybe they'll get some more guys to go. And also, interestingly, had a very strong Latino appeal. They had a good chunk of their audience. I think about a quarter was Latino. <clears throat> so uh, the Peanuts movie, very good, very, very solid debut. Uh, then let's go to the other openers before we look at the rest. Well, let's look at the rest of the top 10 because I have it up here. All right, so uh, the rest of the top 10, uh, everybody did pretty well. The Martian continues to be an amazing performer, only dropped 20%, but you can see the disparity in the rest of the box office, right? You've got like 73, 45, and then 9.3. It's like, wow. Uh, everybody basically went to one of, the, one of those two movies this weekend if they were going. Uh, but The Martian, uh, almost at, uh, at 200 million uh, world, I mean, domestically in total. That's very nice in six weeks. Um, Goosebumps, still doing well post-Halloween. That's a pleasant surprise. Uh, only a 30% drop. You would think that would have a huge drop post-Halloween. And then Bridge of Spies continues to hold nicely as well. Uh, but it's only up to 54 total. That's going to be something that has to really find its audience in the ancillary market, which is, you know, uh, television, streaming, rentals, purchase with DVD, etc. 
Uh, then Hotel Transylvania 2 uh, holds uh, held nicely as well. Uh, Burnt, uh, Last Witch Hunter, they dropped considerably. But look at these numbers. They're so paltry. It's hard to believe that, that warrants a spot in the top 10. Look, the intern and paranormal uh, activity, the ghost dimension, have in the one one point range. That's just absolutely insane. But it is worth noting that the inter well, the highest numbers here are, besides uh, the Martian, you've got Hotel Transylvania 2 at 161. But then look at the intern at 71. That's fantastic. That is a slow burn. You don't really see movies with legs anymore. That's how movies used to perform at the box office. So seven weeks in to really get to that 71 million range, I think is very nice for that picture. Uh, let's just look. Actually, I'm very curious now that I've seen that. Uh, that's a $35 million picture, and it's up to 180 worldwide. That's insane. That's fantastic. That's great for not only Anne Hathaway and Robert De Niro, but it really points that uh, Nancy Myers just really has a great formula that can, that still works. So that's amazing. That's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, performance. I can't believe how well that movie did. Um, I'm, I'm looking at its foreign box office. It did very well in Japan. You know, we said it had a strong Asian appeal. South Korea, 23, because they really respect uh, elders in their community. But that's just amazing business. Now let's look at the specialty market where we had a number of movies debut. And it's really a tough award season for everybody. No one's having a good time. Uh, and you know, Steve Jobs, for instance, uh, third week of wide release, it's already out of the top 10. And it made less than a million dollars for the entire weekend, 70% drop. That's so bad. All right, so Miss You Already, that's the Drew Barrymore movie with Tony Collette. That actually opened the biggest of all the uh, small films in 384 uh, theaters, <clears throat> but it's only a 1400, you know, 14K per theater, 1,490 per theater average. Very weak. Uh, Spotlight, everyone's saying that's the big winner, but that's just a matter of perspective. Spotlight doesn't have the kind of box office that one would expect for that type of movie. I think Spotlight's been poorly advertised. I think it has a horrible title. Uh, I just don't think that it, it's something that people are going to have to discover if it gets traction during award season. That opened in five theaters and it pulled in a 60000 per screen average, which is nice. Again, it's nice, uh, but it's not, what it, not like a movie like that should be. Uh, Brooklyn was the other big opener uh, in the limited specialty market. It also opened in five theaters, but it only pulled in 36,000 per screen. And then Trumbo also opened on, on another five theaters, and that pulled in only 15,000 per, per uh, screen. So, you know, Brian Cranston, I, I, I hope that there's like some long-term strategy that just isn't making itself apparent, but he was in such a wonderful place coming off of Breaking Bad. And now I think he has just taken him, you know, from the disappointing, uh, his disappoint, the, the disappointing size of his role in Godzilla uh, and just the disappointment in that film overall. And then films like this, you know, what does Brian Cranston's career really look like at this point? You know, and he's focusing so hard on LBJ, both, uh, you know, he has the HBO special coming up. You know, I, I, maybe he has enough money from Breaking uh, Breaking Bad. And he's like, I don't need to, you know, be a big box office star. That's fine. I'm just going to go and make little projects that interest me and my fan base will follow me around. But for how long? He has to re-energize that fan base, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an art form. You know, they have the old saying, one for you, one for them, one for me, which means, okay, you make an, uh, a film that's artistically rewarding to you, but then you have to go and make something that pleases the mass audience to keep yourself on the radar and to make you still a commodity to Hollywood. And Brian Cranston isn't doing that, which is a shame because I just reviewed Trumbo this morning um, and I think it's a fantastic movie. So it's not only a shame for Brian Cranston that it's doing so poorly, but it's a shame for the movie itself. All right, so that's the weekend box office. And of course, uh, next weekend, uh, it looks really weak. Uh, I guess nobody wants to open right before uh, like the Hunger Games hits theaters and also uh, the night before and the secret in their eyes. Like November 20th is a huge weekend, but this coming weekend, all we have is the 33, uh, about the, the the miners that with Antonio Banderas. We have uh, Love the Coopers, uh, a Christmas movie that's insanely early, uh, and then we have the All American, which might be a surprise, uh, you know, a surprisingly strong contender due to the strength of religious films as of late. And that's like a very All American, Middle American movie. And so we'll see if they can, you know, get the audience into the theater. And they seem to be doing a better job with those movies than like the usual Hollywood fare, uh, you know, energizing the base. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Uh, so let's touch on the other two. Uh, one is something that a lot of you tweeted me about over the weekend, and that was the headline late Friday that Chloe Grace Moretz has been cast as the Little Mermaid, not for Disney, 
but for Universal. Now, you might recall that's the live-action fairy tale that was supposed to have Sofia Coppola directing, uh, but she had to leave because she didn't agree, obviously, I guess, with this casting. She wanted, you know, um, uh, Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman's daughter to play the lead role, and Universal was like, she's not a star, but I would contend that Chloe Grace Moretz is not a star. I think she makes a nice headline, but let's not forget Carrie. She was uh, in that remake, and I have to say, I saw Carrie, and I gave it a good review. I thought it was a good movie, and I thought Chloe Grace Moretz was very good in it. She was also a great hit girl but for some reason Chloe Grace Moretz just does not get anyone to go to the theater right maybe The Little Mermaid will be the movie that reinvents her which finally makes her a box office draw but if I were Universal would I really want to take that chance right would I be like well maybe this movie I mean she's not an unknown commodity at this point you know kind of like Lily James off of Downton Abbey for Cinderella also there you have the Disney brand and live action fairy tales are so successful at this point that to some degree they you know they are the, they are their own thing you know they don't need a huge cast necessarily and they also have Kate Blanchett so we'll see how the rest of this cast comes together but I think that because Universal is new to this business and the the, the the failures that Warner Brothers has had specifically most recently with Pan I don't know why it would seem they want to repeat that with uh, their Little Mermaid so I think Chloe Grace Moretz is talented as I think she is we'll see if maybe the fifth element does okay I don't think it's going to do that well but clearly not a box office draw and not someone I would have hired I think it's a mistake uh, not to say again that she wouldn't do a good job, but that's not all Hollywood is. It's not just about whether or not you can do a good job. Um, you know, it's whether or not you can get anyone to see it. So we'll see. And also, because Chloe Grace Moretz is uh, passed, I wonder if they're going to focus a little bit more on the scarier elements of The Little Mermaid. I mean, Hans Christian Andersen, fairy tales are rough stuff. You know, Disney's the one that made them a little more family friendly. So considering her track record and the kind of movies she's made, you know, it would be interesting to see if maybe they go in that reaction, that direction a little bit, and then if that will affect the box office at all. And then finally, I have another story that people wrote, I got a lot of tweets about, and that was uh, the live action Dora the Explorer movie that's, uh, you know, being moved ahead. Now, the, 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 the uh, framing for this story was that Tom Wheeler is finally uh, no longer at DreamWorks Animation. His contract is up and he's a free agent. And apparently everyone was just waiting for Tom Wheeler's contract to end which I don't understand because Tom Wheeler, sure, he wrote Puss in Boots, but Puss in Boots was a good movie, but it wasn't like, who wrote this? I want to hire them, right? And then also the other only, other only other big thing he's done was that Cape TV series. You know, you might recall it was on NBC. It was really short-lived and it was about a guy who had like a cape and he was trying to train to be a vigilante. And it was just like, what is this? This is horrible. This is just like everything wrong with network TV in a nutshell. So I don't know why anybody would be waiting outside DreamWorks Animation for Tom Wheeler to walk out. I, you know, I'd be like, call me and I'll think about it. But anyway, apparently people are. So he's not only working on a Micronauts uh, script, but also a live-action Dora the Explorer. Now, I think that a live-action Dora the Explorer, with or without Tom Wheeler, is a great idea. It's a great property. The Latino audience just gets stronger and stronger. Look what they did for Peanuts. Uh, and also, you know, Dora is... a bilingual and then also I think you know universal in her appeal and she says she has like jungle adventures she's got a monkey I mean this thing just writes itself uh, and maybe with Tom Wheeler it better because I, don't, I think again his writing is medium but I'm curious to know if they're going to age Dora up at all to maybe make this a little bit more all ages friendly I mean because if it's like kid Dora and she's aged up even in her own show so I think there's some precedent set for it but I just don't know how many people are going to go and see a really uh, youth, you know, youth oriented um, door, live action Dora the Explorer movie. It's maybe going to seem a little too Spy Kids, of course, another movie that had a very strong uh, Latino aspects to it. Uh, to its credit, and the Spy Kids franchise, let's not forget, started out fantastic, not only in terms of quality, but success, and then went off the rails, kind of like as Robert Rodriguez did. But, you know, and it's interesting that he's not doing that. Uh, you know, he's not involved in this. You would think it would be right up his alley, but, uh, you know, I think we all would like him to stop making family-friendly movies, because not only is it ruining his career, but he's got, getting less and less good at it with each one. But anyway, I'm curious, do you want to see a live-action Dora movie? And how? what age would you make Dora in the film? I would make her, I think, a teenager. I think it would expand the audience. Uh, and, you know, they have that, that sketch that they made. Uh, there's a comedy sketch about what a Dora the Explorer a live-action movie would be like. And I think while it's funny and comedic, I would, I would up the ante. I would make it a little bit of a blockbuster. I guess I would go for a journey to the center of the earth kind of feel. The Dwayne, you know, the movie, the franchise that Brendan Fraser started and then went to Dwayne Johnson and, you know, has done quite well. I would like to see 
I think I would like to see Dora occupy the same space. And it's a proven success rate, so Hollywood should like that as well. All right, so anyway, that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, you know, the box office report and these two stories. Uh, and then thank you again for everyone who entered. So please let me know what you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.